Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. This week, we learn about zombie mines. No, not places with zombies, but, well, you'll understand more after we talk with Allison Gitlin, who coordinates the Campaign to Restore and Protect the Greater Grand Canyon Eco-Region Campaign for the Sierra Club Grand Canyon Chapter. It's all about uranium mining in the Grand Canyon region and why that is not a good idea. Plus, you'll have the ever-popular Numb Nuts of the Week, activist shout-outs, the daily show Make Me Your Nuclear Pundit outreach, and more nuclear information than Fox Faux News, put that in quotes, could ever put together on their best year. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday. February 24th, 2015, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. In the U.S., a big win on the way to what we hope will be an even bigger win. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit Court have decided that they will hear a case brought by Friends of the Earth alleging that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission illegally allowed Pacific Gas and Electric to alter the Diablo Canyon nuclear plant's license. What makes this even more delicious is that the court decided over the stated objections of PG&E and the NRC. Hooyah! Diablo Canyon is in San Luis Obispo and Avila Beach, which is south of San Francisco on the Pacific Coast. Since it was commissioned in 1968 and first began operation in 1985, new dangerous earthquake faults have been discovered, which compromise the safety of the facility. Friends of the Earth, in conjunction with local activists, the San Luis Obispo Mothers for Peace, and others, contend that the NRC acted in secret and in collusion with PG&E to hide Diablo Canyon's vulnerability to earthquakes stronger than it was built to withstand. A decision in favor of the plaintiffs could result in PG&E being forced to shut down the reactors pending a public hearing to examine new earthquake risks at the plant. The D.C. Circuit ruled on February 20th not to grant a motion by the NRC and PG&E to dismiss the case on procedural grounds. Instead, the judges instructed that the case should be heard on its merits. Damon Moglin, Senior Strategic Advisor, Friends of the Earth, said, This is a big victory. The public has a right to know what the NRC and PG&E won't admit. Hundreds of thousands of people are put at immediate risk by earthquake danger at Diablo Canyon. The evidence will show that the NRC and PG&E colluded to illegally change the terms of Diablo Canyon's operating license to cover up the fact that it cannot withstand a rupture of the larger, more powerful earthquake faults that have been discovered since the reactors were designed. This means the plant violates its operating license and must be shut down. Amen. And a women to that. Also in California, things are coming down hot and heavy against Michael Peavy, the former head of the California Public Utilities Commission. According to Loretta Lynch, who is CPUC Commission President immediately before Peavy, quote, the CPUC is now a rogue agency. All the checks and balances that existed at the CPUC have been corrupted. PV led that corruption. Strong words and every one of them is earned because this reflects directly on the shenanigans between the CPUC and Southern California Edison around the closure of San Onofre. At stake for the Utilities Commission and also for Southern California Edison is the bailout of SCE over San Onofre as well as the pending disbursement of $1.3 billion in taxpayer money for the purchase of thin canisters, dry casks of dubious merit, and known problems in the coastal saltwater environment that SCE is proposing be bought for San Onofre as a way to kick the canister down the road for only 20 years, if they even last that long. 
We'll be posting a video on this issue put together by Mary Beth Brangan and Jim Heddle of Eon3. It's up on YouTube, and we'll have other links as well dealing directly with this issue. It does have implications for anyone else involved with reactor closures, so enjoy the information, and let's all get busy. A recent article from the Anchorage, Alaska Dispatch News on Valentine's Day, February 14th, stated that a rash of sleep-related infant deaths troubles health officials in Alaska. Well, Dr. Janet Sherman and Joseph Mangano of Radiation and Public Health Project wrote an article for Counterpunch that points out that these deaths may be linked to radiation from Fukushima. In the article... Many of the infant deaths are attributed to babies sleeping with parents, alcohol abuse, poor parenting, like that. However, infant mortality in Alaska had been falling for years. But in 2012 to 2013, 122 infants died compared to 85 deaths only two years before, meaning before Fukushima. Consideration should be given to the arrival of radioactive fallout from Fukushima after the 2011, Mangano and Sherman wrote. Radiation levels were highest in Alaska, Hawaii, and the Pacific West Coast. This increased number of deaths represents a 37% increase per 100,000 live births. We'll link to this article on the website because it's got really good, solid statistical information in it. And I wish to note that both Mangano and Sherman are asking that careful and complete autopsies be performed on the dead babies and that levels of radioisotopes be measured in humans and wildlife. On February 24th, the nuclear reactor at Limerick, Pennsylvania, experienced a hot shutdown or scram, something that is no bueno for the reactor. A valve that wasn't supposed to close closed, reactor pressure rose, and that's what triggered the shutdown. And in an odd story that's been making the rounds, bizarre milky rain was reported to have fallen for days in Washington and Oregon. While not specifically nuclear in nature, there was one comment from a Reuters article that I found chilling. Federal scientists at the Hanford nuclear site have suggested that winds may have carried ash from Japan's Sakurajima volcano. If ash from a volcano can cross the Pacific, might not the ash from burning of radioactive debris from Fukushima, which is currently taking place all over northeast Japan, also put ash, potentially radioactive ash, into the air and bring it across the ocean where it could land on the Pacific coast and elsewhere? Just a question, not yet an answer. Over in Japan, at Fukushima Daiichi, lots of bad news about the water. Groundwater from wells that were sampled on the 16th and 19th of February showed tritium density the highest it has ever been at three of 12 bypass wells at the site. The contaminated groundwater pumped up from these wells are to be discharged into the Pacific. On February 22nd, multiple alarms were set off at Fukushima Daiichi as their sensors detected a fresh leak of highly radioactive water into the sea. Contamination levels in a gutter reportedly spiked up to 70 times over regular readings. So there were massive spikes in strontium-90 levels and tritium levels. TEPCO claims its usual cluelessness and actually tweeted out, quote, No contaminated water leakage has been confirmed at Fukushima Daiichi NPS. However, radioactive data has temporarily risen at the drainage. So, in other words, there's been no leakage, but there has been this spike in radiation. Twits on Twitter. But what no one seems to be factoring in is that on February 16, there was a 6.7 magnitude earthquake in the northeast region of Japan. All the elevated radiation readings in the water were recorded within seven days of that quake. Might there be a connection? Again, a question with no answer 
yet. Another set of twitticisms came about when the other ABC News, the Australian Broadcasting Company, took a guided tour of the wreckage of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. TEPCO representatives are reported as saying that major steps have been taken to decommission the molten reactors. What's wrong with that sentence? You cannot decommission wreckage. All you can do is clean it up and try to mitigate the radiation. This same miswording seems to be embedded in the hearts, brains, and copy written by the propaganda hacks at World Nuclear News. They wrote on February 18 that significant tasks have been completed in the cleanup and decommissioning of the damaged Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. However, many challenging issues remain. Guys, guys, significant? That null and void pay no attention to the man behind the curtain word? Clean up? Oh, my God, this thing can never be cleaned up. Decommission, we've already spoken of. And to say that Fukushima Daiichi is damaged is like saying the bomb at Hiroshima helped clear the way for urban renewal. Spin, spin, spin. So the International Atomic Energy Agency claims to see improvements at Fukushima Daiichi, but that's because they're looking through concrete colored glasses that are about that thick. But that's not even the worst, because now it's time for... Nuclear Hot Seat, Nuclear Hot Seat, Nuclear Hot Seat, none that's out of week. Nobody likes airplane food, but All Nippon Airways, ANA, has taken its in-flight meals to a new depth by creating an unholy alliance with the locavore movement. That's right. In their marketing, they feature local food from all around Japan and have just announced that they are going to be serving ingredients produced in Fukushima. If you fly with ANA between this March to May, you might want to avoid certain foods that are known to be sourced from Fukushima, including peaches, tomatoes, beef, and 12, count them, 12 kinds of local Japanese rice wine which will be served in their lounges during international flights. But even if you're not flying internationally, you don't need to feel deprived because a local Fukushima newspaper reported that locally produced tomatoes will also be served for in-flight meals as part of the flights in Europe, North America, and Singapore. Strangely enough, this particular factoid is not mentioned on ANA's website for some reason. Hmm, I wonder what that might be. 100 becquerels of cesium per kilogram of food is considered legal in Japan. So if you're going to be flying with ANA from March to May, chow down, have a good time, and let the cancer clock in the back of your brain in the epidemiological study of your life begin. And that's why this week, All Nippon Airways is... Nuclear hot seat, none that's out. Checking the international news, Russia's bad, bad nuclear past is coming back to haunt us all. Before the London Convention of 1972, an international agreement that prohibited marine dumping of nuclear waste, countries were free to use the oceans as trash heaps for any nuclear garbage they had around. Though the Soviets signed the treaty in the late 1980s, it wasn't until after the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991 that the Russians opened up to the international community about the extent of the Arctic dumping campaign. I guess they were sharing their inventory from that new 12-step meeting, Nuclear Anonymous. And boy, did they have amends to make. According to the Bologna Foundation, citing the Norwegian Radiation Protection Authorities, the Soviet Union dumped 19 ships containing radioactive waste, 14 nuclear reactors, including five that still contain spent fuel, 735 other pieces of radioactively contaminated heavy machinery, 17,000 containers of radioactive waste, three nuclear submarines in the seas, and a partridge in a pear tree. Some of what they dumped were in bodies of water that were often not that far from neighboring countries. But even worse, 
As energy companies are seeking to drill in those same waters, the Russian government has shown an interest in cleaning up its nuclear waste, but after decades of sitting on the ocean floor, some of the most dangerous pieces may be too unstable to remove, leaving the potential for radioactive material to leak, which could disrupt commercial fisheries and destroy aquatic ecosystems. It's been proposed that if the waste can't be removed, it could be protected with covers that would keep radioactive material contained in the event of a leak. But try finding a material that will last as long as nuclear waste. 480,000 years, anyone? In the UK, a government advisor has warned that Britain's aging nuclear power plants are vulnerable to terrorist attacks by unmanned drones that could kill thousands of people. John Large, an engineer for Britain's Atomic Energy Authority, says ministers are ignoring risks posed by nuclear terror assaults. Nuclear power stations around the U.K. suffered 37 security breaches in 2014, the highest number since 2011. Large is calling for urgent security reforms and demanding the government set up a major operation to test the resilience of Britain's power plants against prospective attacks. And in France, Arriva, a nuclear tech company, 87% of which is owned by the French government, has posted net losses of 4.9 billion euros or $5.6 billion for 2014 which is threatening the U.K.'s Hinkley Point nuclear power facility because Arriva is supposed to be supplying the reactor. Guys, just dump the whole mess and go solar. We'll have today's featured interview in just a moment, but first, Nuclear Hot Seat relies on your donations to help us keep going and growing. It's the support of listeners to this show who have made it possible for me to leave tomorrow to attend Dr. Helen Caldecott's symposium in New York City. My deepest gratitude to those of you who donated specifically to help me get there. And a reminder that this show has ongoing expenses, which I need help in meeting. So if you have the opportunity to donate, no amount is too small, we make it easy for you. Just go to the website, nuclearhotseat.com, scroll down on the home page, click on the red Donate button, and there you have it. And all the rest is through PayPal. Know that whatever you can give is deeply appreciated. And a special shout out with thanks to those of you who have become sustaining members of Nuclear Hot Seat with your monthly donations. You know who you are and you have my gratitude. You know, some things are sacred. And for those of us who love nature, who love this planet, the Grand Canyon ranks among the greatest and the grandest of them all. But nuclear short-sightedness continues to threaten this planetary treasure. And that's what we're going to talk about with this week's guest. Allison Gitlin coordinates the campaign to restore and protect the Greater Grand Canyon Ecoregion campaign for the Sierra Club Grand Canyon chapter. She holds a master's degree in biological sciences from Northern Arizona University, where she studied the ecology and hydrology of desert flood plains. She's been advocating for Arizona's environment since moving to the state 20 years ago. As to part of what motivates her, Allison grew up across the Hudson River from the Indian Point nuclear power plant, where regular siren tests in her neighborhood warned her of an ever-present danger of radiation contamination. Now, she brings that awareness to guarding one of our greatest treasures from a radiologic threat. Allison Gitlin, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. How did you become involved in the Sierra Club and the issues regarding uranium mining at the Grand Canyon? Well, I had been active working with water issues for a number of years in Arizona, and so after I began my job with the Sierra Club, I got to know the uranium issue much better. I was familiar with the issues of limited water sources in Arizona and those water sources being susceptible to contamination, but I really got to know the uranium issue much better in the last few years. Let's take it back into the history of uranium mining. What is the background of this issue as regards the Grand Canyon? 
Well, there is a long history of uranium mining around the Grand Canyon region. During the atomic era, there was a lot of mining, especially on the Navajo Nation. The Navajo Nation is a large reservation that spans the four corner states, so Arizona, New Mexico, Utah. And during the height of the atomic era, there were hundreds of uranium mines throughout the Navajo Nation, and the miners were working in unprotected conditions, and the disposal of the radioactive waste was not very controlled. So there is a legacy of waste in this region that goes back some time, and there has been, unfortunately, quite a bit of living with health effects for the people of the region. You may or may not know that the largest release of radiation in the United States actually occurred on the Navajo Nation, Church Rock, New Mexico, in 1979, when there was a spill during a large flood. Bring it forward several years, and during the 1970s and 80s, there was a second era of uranium mining in this region, and that pretty much came to an end when the price of uranium fell because we started getting reprocessed uranium from weapons that were being decommissioned at the end of the Cold War. So we really went through an era without a whole lot of uranium mining here, and the price of uranium has skyrocketed over the last decade. And so suddenly we started to see hundreds of new uranium mining claims in the Grand Canyon region again. In response to that and the threat of so much uranium mining happening here, The United States government implemented a 20-year moratorium on new mines in the Grand Canyon region. So we're just a few years into that, but it's not anything permanent, and there's supposed to be more science being done during that time. So right now, new mines can't be dug, but what are being considered valid existing rights are being allowed to be redeveloped in the Grand Canyon region. That's what we're dealing with right now is that there is still the threat of new mining occurring, and with that comes the threat of new contamination. Let's roll this back just slightly to fill in the picture even more. What is the biggest problem with uranium mining in the Grand Canyon region, and what's the biggest fear? We have a number of people here who are living with a legacy of waste and with the illness associated with that. The Grand Canyon region is a very arid region. We have very limited amount of water, and most of the biodiversity, as well as the humans in the region, are dependent on places where the groundwater emerges in the form of springs. Once that groundwater is contaminated, we don't know how to clean it up. And so the problem we have is that on the Navajo Nation and on the Hopi Reservation, there are contaminated water sources. And where these new mines are being built around Grand Canyon, those places are also in contact with groundwater that feeds the seeps and springs of Grand Canyon within Grand Canyon National Park and just around it, as well as the Havasupai Reservation, which relies on springs that pour out of the ground there. We are spending tens of millions of dollars on the Navajo Nation to try and prevent plumes from spreading, and we don't know how to clean it up, let alone contain it. So why would we risk water sources that are not yet contaminated with contamination in this region? Oh, I think greed has a lot to do with it. But uh, <laughs> And when you say plumes, what are you referring to specifically? There are several areas where there's uranium in the groundwater and it's slowly spreading. For example, there's a place near Tuba City where groundwater is being pumped out of the ground and the uranium is being separated from the water, and then water is being re-injected into the ground in an attempt to stop the spread of uranium contamination. And we just don't really know how to do this effectively. We don't know how to clean the groundwater and get all of the uranium out of it. Uranium has an interesting property, which is that when it oxidizes, so when you expose it to the air, it actually becomes more soluble in water. And so it's extremely hard to separate it from the water. And by mining, 
we are breaking it up, fracturing it, and we're actually making it more of a problem. Yeah. Uh, the thought of this happening in and around the Grand Canyon, which is such a not only United States, but also an international treasure, I mean, a planetary treasure, is heartbreaking. Now, you said that there was a 20-year ban that we are now in the middle of. There is a problem, however, with Canyon Mine. Why does this ban not constrain that particular mine? The 20-year ban on new mines does not apply to what are considered to be valid existing rights. Now, these are supposed to be places where they are already dug and already in operation and where there is what is being considered an economically valid claim. Now, Canyon Mine is being considered one of these places because it sat on standby for decades. What do you mean that it was on standby? Standby is a state, we call them zombie mines. They essentially go into this state where they're not dead. They're sort of sleeping. Places like Canyon Mine, they began to drill and the price of uranium fell. And so they put this mine into this state of standby where it's not a closed mine, but it's sitting on our public lands with a fence around it and part of the infrastructure there. In this case, it sat for several decades. The original plan of operations on the mine was issued in 1986. It's now 2015, and this mine's never produced uranium yet. The shaft isn't completely sunk, but yet it's being considered as a valid existing right because some operation had started there some time ago. That sounds less like a legitimate argument and more of a gaming of the information. Correct, and especially since this mine supposedly is economically viable, but they put it into standby last year when the price of uranium fell, and now they're saying they're going to reopen it again. So if it is that close to being economically not viable that it's going to be in and out of operations as the price fluctuates, we really need to ask, is this a valid existing right? And who gets to make that decision? In this case, the Forest Service, because the Canyon Mine is on Forest Service lands. Part of that 20-year ban on new mines is also on land managed by the Bureau of Land Management. So not all of these decisions are made by the U.S. Forest Service. Some could be made by the Bureau of Land Management. Let's talk about the specific risks from the Canyon Mine that make it so contentious. The Canyon Mine is very close to Grand Canyon, obviously. Um, it's also above this groundwater plume that feeds the springs of Havasupai and of Grand Canyon. It is close to the town of Tucson, and their water is also groundwater derived. And it's also close to a place called Red Butte that is a traditional cultural property for the Havasupai, and um, it's also revered by other tribes in the region. You know, there are several tribes that have been occupying the Grand Canyon region for millennia. It is in this place, this traditional cultural property was not declared when the original 1986 Environmental Impact Statement and Plan of Operations for the Canyon Mine were issued. And so these places weren't really considered when the Canyon Mine was originally permitted to open. There are both environmental reasons and also cultural reasons for not wanting this mine to open. Now, Nuclear Hot Seat has been in continuous production for over three and a half years. And I recall that sometime last year there was a ruling that said that the mines were shut down. There was some court case. Can you clarify what that point was? There is a lawsuit right now. The Sierra Club, along with the Havasupai Tribe, the Center for Biological Diversity, and the Grand Canyon Trust, are suing the Forest Service over the decision to open this mine. And while that lawsuit is pending, there was an agreement negotiated that the mine operators consented to put this mine on standby until the decision was made. They were hoping to have a decision made before December, 
And now they're announcing again that they are going to take this mine out of standby and put it into operation. So yep. I think you're probably thinking of that agreement that they made to put the mine on standby again. And that is a decision completely in the hands of the mine owners. Yes, that's they made with some of the conservation groups. But they only committed until December, and now that it's after December, they're saying they're going to open this mine again. We are expecting a decision in that court case soon, so it will be partially up to the judges, of course. Let me play devil's advocate for a moment. Mining companies argue that with modern mining technologies, it's safer than it used to be. So what did they used to do? What are they doing differently now? And in truth, from your perspective, how much impact is that having on safety issues? Well, it's a great question. They say that mining is safer than it used to be, but yet they are operating under a 1986 environmental impact statement and plan of operations. And they're saying that there is no new science or not enough science that has come to be known since 1986, not enough new information to warrant a new environmental impact statement. We know since then that there is a new traditional cultural property that was declared. We know that the U.S. Geological Survey went out and did a bunch of research, and they found that every single place where they sampled for soil contamination near previous mines, that they did find elevated levels of radiation. They know that they found 15 springs and five wells in the region that exceeded the drinking water standard for uranium, and all of those were tied to previous mining. So we do have more information since 1986. If they are so sure that they are going to be cleaner this time and that they're not going to cause any impacts, then why are they afraid of updating their environmental impact statement? They're doing nothing differently. This is hard rock mining. They're going down and they are cutting the uranium out of the walls of their shafts and they are bringing it to the surface and then they are driving it to a mill and processing it at the mill. There is no difference in the way that they are doing this now than what they were doing in the 70s and the 1980s. You know, some of the people I've interviewed for this show are from northern Saskatchewan and our First Nations people in Canada, and they shared on the show about the legend that came down with their people that there is a black rock in the earth, and as long as the black rock is left in the earth, it is safe and it will not harm anyone. But as soon as it is brought to the surface and touched, it becomes a danger. They didn't have equipment to be able to say, okay, this is uranium and let's test it. This was just something that was passed traditionally through the people that, of course, has been proven out with the danger that comes from uranium being brought to the surface and the contamination that comes with it. Given that this is on native land in the United States, what has been the health impact on the people who live in proximity with these mines and with the groundwater and springs that have been contaminated? The people of the Navajo Nation actually had extremely low cancer levels prior to the onset of uranium mining. It is fascinating when we look to these people because they have extremely long lifespans and they were actually the target of studies because of the fact that there was so little cancer amongst them. Now that has changed. It's really sad. Of course, a lot of the people who did mine or who did drive the trucks around, unfortunately, we have lost a lot of these people already. Girls on the Navajo Nation have 17 times higher reproductive cancer rates oh than God. the general public because of their exposure. There are elevated levels of several diseases that have been found in towns where there is more uranium mining and in closer to proximity to tailings. We know that uranium acts kind of like a heavy metal in human systems, and so uh, it has effects on reproduction, diabetes, kidney disease, certain autoimmune diseases, and high blood pressure have been found to be highest in Navajo communities with the highest number of abandoned mines, according to preliminary results of a health study in the Eastern Navajo Agency.
I have heard that diabetes levels are elevated in areas close to mine tailings, even above the already elevated levels of diabetes that we see on the reservation. These people have been dealing with a horrible, horrible legacy, and it's heartbreaking when you talk to these families. I sat with this one woman, and she was telling me, oh, yeah, the EPA came out here, and they did measurements, and they said that my kitchen was hot, but my bedroom was fine. And I said, when was that? Oh, about a year ago. I just can't imagine other cultures having to deal with this when, you know, oh, your your kitchen is radioactive, but your bedroom is fine. You know, and, and I just can't imagine anybody dealing with that and then it taking a year for somebody to get back to them and tell them what to do about it. That's not an uncommon situation in Japan if they're even acknowledged to have a problem there at all after Fukushima. Of course, Mining companies also are promising that they're going to be able to reclaim these places so nobody would even know they were there, not even a fingerprint or a footprint left behind. How successful have previous mine restoration projects been? And what, if any, assurances do we have that current mines will be fully reclaimed? We have no assurance that there is any capability to fully restore these areas. The USGS went out, as I mentioned, and they put a, out a report in 2010 based on research that they did around the Grand Canyon. They sampled a number of mines. They sampled a number of springs that were in proximity to mines. And everywhere they looked for contamination, they found it. They found soil contamination. They found some water sources, wells, and springs that were contaminated as well. And all of those were associated with mining. The Orphan Mine in Grand Canyon, it's actually a mine that's in Grand Canyon National Park and has been since closed. That was pointed to in the environmental impact study for the Canyon Mine as an example of how we can successfully reclaim abandoned mines. Later on, it was found that that area was extremely hot. They had to move the fencing further back because the soil contamination extended so far from the mine site. And our taxpayer dollars paid to have that area cleaned up. The areas on Bureau of Land Management land that are supposedly cleaned up have been exposed to things like flooding that has washed tailings down into our public lands where that uranium ore is now sitting there, contaminating areas where people recreate, where wildlife go and drink. We do not know how to clean these places up. And the fact that the Bureau of Land Management brags about being able to clean these places up so that you would never know they were there makes me a little upset as someone who recreates on public lands because these are not places I want to camp. These are not places where I want to pump water with a water filter so that I have hydration while I'm hiking. These are not places where I necessarily want to be hunting when animals are grazing in these areas. And yet they're not necessarily signed or, you know, we're not notified of the fact that these were areas that were previously mined. It's very upsetting. And so the fact that they claim that you won't see it, yeah, you won't see it unless you go out with a Geiger counter. This is terribly upsetting. Given that the orphan mine, for the one that you named, is actually in the Grand Canyon, to what extent have tourists been informed that this is a potential risk? And if they haven't been, what do you think would be the impact if they were? Well, there is now signage. You know, it's very low-key, but there is fencing with signage, and it says something like restoration area. It doesn't really notify people completely. Restoration I, as in, oh, we're putting the native plants back in without mentioning anything about uranium or radiation and the possible dangers? The orphan mine does have fencing. Most of the signage says something like restoration area and doesn't really indicate what's being restored. There is some signage that does talk about the orphan mine, but they do keep it pretty low-key. 
it's not something that you're likely to really notice or pay attention to if you're the average tourist coming through. But it's interesting because I have talked to many people who worked at Grand Canyon over the years who tell me about, oh, yeah, we used to go into the offices on the mine site and camp out there. We would sleep. We would hang out. We'd drink beers in there. You know, so a lot of people were exposed to this area without really knowing the risks. It's fenced off now, but it's really not something that, you know, when you go to Grand Canyon National Park, it's not really something that is put into your conscious awareness with very much intent. I could just see the postcards now. Come to the Grand Canyon. Glow in the dark. Well, it's interesting, you know, because this area, the economic generators of the Grand Canyon region are not mining. The economic generators of the Grand Canyon region is the Grand Canyon. People are coming here for tourism reasons. And so when we think about the canyon mine being developed, we're talking about, you know, maybe 10 to 12 ore trucks a day that are going to be sharing the road with tourists driving to Grand Canyon. And if there is an accident, it is going to have economic implications because there's going to be the perception of a contamination threat and probably also a real contamination threat to people who are, you know, on that road. So it's interesting when we talk about what is the foundation of our economy here. It is not the boom-bust mining cycle. It is Grand Canyon tourism. And is it worth risking that tourism for a temporary revenue from a mine? And these mines, these are small deposits. These things are open for just a couple of years, and then we have to deal with the legacy of contamination forever. From your perspective with the Sierra Club, What's in the future for Canyon Mine and for the uranium industry around Grand Canyon? I mean, is this a done deal? Are there still grounds for fighting it? Do we have a good chance? What kind of a chance do we have? Well, we will continue to still fight uranium mines around Grand Canyon. There are a few mines north of Grand Canyon that have been operational in the last few years. And... They're already mining out their entire deposits. The Kanab North Mine, north of Grand Canyon, the overburden from that mine actually sat on site for 20 years, just blowing in the wind. There is a ton of contamination. They kept saying that they were going to reopen it. It was just on standby. It wasn't really closed. And then they decided that there wasn't enough ore left, so they're not going to reopen it. The canyon mine, we're predicting something similar is probably going to happen there, where if they do open it, it's only going to be a few years. So knowing what we know now about the risk of contamination, I think that we do have a good fight on our hands. With the Grand Canyon area being assaulted by potentially radioactive water, by dust from the mines and the tailings, This seems like it would be a huge story to be covered. What has been the media response or the media coverage of these issues? There have been a few good stories on the contamination in the region, but it hasn't really had the traction you would think it deserves. You know, as far as the human interest story of the people who are living with this legacy of contamination, That is a story that emerges every once in a while and then subsides. I think people see it as so far away. They don't realize that these are real people who are having to deal with this problem. It's sad because when I've tried to get people to cover the story, I have often gotten the response of, well, there's not really a new story. What's the new story to this? This has been going on for some time. The American people do care about this. When this 20-year moratorium on new mines was proposed, there were hundreds of thousands of people who sent in comments saying that this is what they wanted, that they want the Grand Canyon protected. But yet the media has been a little bit slower on the uptake and really hasn't wanted to cover this very much. 
You know, it's, I, I won't say they haven't covered it at all, but I don't think that their coverage is equivalent to the caring of the American people about this. What, if anything, can listeners to Nuclear Hot Seat do to help and to support you? One of the things that we are trying to do is to create a national monument in this area because a national monument designation would prevent the establishment of new mines in the area. It would make that 20-year mining ban permanent. There are other bits of legislation that have been introduced Raul Grijalva is an Arizona representative who several years in a row has introduced the Grand Canyon Watershed Protection Act that would make that permanent. But unfortunately, that bill has never gotten out of subcommittee or committee. And so it's never gotten to the main floor of the House of Representatives. And so instead, we are proposing to create a national monument in the entire region. And that would be called the Grand Canyon Watershed National Monument. And so if people are in support of that, what they could do is to write to President Obama and say that they would like to see a Grand Canyon Watershed National Monument created. They could write to the Secretary of the Interior, Sally Jewell, and say that they are fully behind this idea. If they're interested, they can search online. There are a number of conservation groups who have letters ready to go that they could just, you know, click and send. They could also contact our uh, local, if they're in northern Arizona, they can contact our representative, Ann Kirkpatrick, and thank her because she just sent a letter to President Obama along with Raul Grijalva and Ruben Gallego saying that they support this idea of a national monument. And so uh, if people are in Arizona, if they could send a thank you to those representatives, I think that would be great as well so that they can see that they're doing the right thing. They are on the right side in promoting this. You will, of course, provide a link to the people you wish to have contacted and especially a link to the models of the letters that we might be able to grab and send. And I will put that up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 192. There is another risk from these mines in the Grand Canyon region that I haven't yet mentioned, and that is the industrialization of the Grand Canyon region. These mine sites, each one has a road to it, has power lines to it. Each one has 10 to 12 trucks a day going into it, coming out of it, depending on the size of the mine. Each one has noise impacts and drilling and rock crushing operations. And if you think about the fact that there are hundreds of mine claims in the region, if these mines are built and those roads and those power lines are put up and the fencing and the head frames and the lights at night, we are taking one of the largest intact core habitats that we have in the United States and a place that you can go to to be in the middle of nowhere to really feel what wilderness feels like. And we're talking about industrializing that landscape. And that is another risk that these mines bring to this region. And the American people don't want that. The American people really cherish Grand Canyon. If you go out and you ask people about this, what do they want to see in the Grand Canyon? They are not saying that they want to go and see mines. (laughs) They want to go and experience wilderness. They want to go experience the forest. They want to go experience the canyons and the springs and the wildlife. They want to go and take their families out biking or hiking. They are not interested in encountering minds all across the landscape let alone what the minds could bring to them unseen but deadly and showing up sometime in their future exactly and the people really do care about this region it's it's so important to so many of us and it's worth protecting allison gitlin i'm glad that you're one of the people who is working to protect our precious grand canyon and i want to thank you for being my guest this week on nuclear hot seat thank you allison gitlin of the grand canyon chapter of the sierra club we will have links to the letters and website she mentioned up on our website 
NuclearHotSeat.com, under this episode, number 192. Hey, John Stewart, I'm coming to New York, and weather permitting, I will be standing in line this Monday, March 2nd, to nab a seat at your show. Now, I've got the pre-ticket, but do you really want me risking pneumonia in order to get in and see you there? Look, Booby, I'm not asking for a red carpet, but a red sleeping bag, tent with a warmer, or, hey, how about just a place to hang out in the lobby of the building in front of a heater? Any of those would be appreciated because, really, dude, it is cold there for a California girl. I am looking forward to mingling our energy fields, even if it is with me sitting humbly in the audience. So get me on your show. Put me on your writing staff. Get me on the air as your nuclear pundit before you go sailing off into the sunset. Activist shoutouts. There is a list of events planned for the March 11, 4th anniversary of the start of the Fukushima nuclear disaster. It can be found on Facebook. What you need to do is search on Facebook for 3.11 Fukushima. And it will come up. The entire title is 311 Fukushima 4th Anniversary Actions. But 311 Fukushima, and it will come up. Lots of things that you can participate in, whether you're close to one of the major population centers or not. One action that we can all take is to intentionally reduce the amount of electricity that we use on March 11. Unplug nuclear power is calling for us to shut off extra lights and cut back on electronics so that we use only essential systems, such as our furnace and refrigerators. They also suggest that we disconnect from the grid if we can. And for those of us with rooftop solar and a feed-in system to the grid, generate more electricity than you can use. Won't be hard. Just get up there and shovel off the solar units. You can get more info about this entire program at UnplugNuclearPower.com. We're all being asked to send or deliver a letter about Fukushima to the Japan consulate nearest you. At Fukushima 4th Anniversary Events.blogspot.com, there are all the specifics and a link to a copy of a letter that you can use. We're a little jealous of England because Arnie Gunderson is going to rip it up with a talk on March 11 at Keswick in Cumbria in the Lake District. It seems to be part of a tour Arnie is doing of England. Knock him alive. And on 311, Ken Musler of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution will be at the Long Beach Aquarium of the Pacific to discuss the impact of Fukushima on marine life. There are some who find Mr. Busler a bit controversial. You can decide for yourself. The evening runs 7 to 8.30 Pacific time, and tickets are only $5, free to seniors, teachers, and students with IDs. If you don't live close enough to attend, not a problem. The event will be live-streamed, and questions will be accepted through Twitter. Tweet at Aquarium Pacific, and tag your question with hashtag AOP, that's Aquarium of the Pacific, hashtag AOP Busler, for a chance to have your question answered at the end during the question and answer session. Just, if you're being controversial in your question, don't hold your breath. It will be asked. You can learn more at aquariumofthepacific.org slash events, and we will also have a link up on our website. There's much more happening to commemorate the triple catastrophe of March 11, 2011, the earthquake, tsunami, start of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster, and the devastating impact on the people of Japan. Realize that anything you do is appreciated, and you're always free to start a new commemorative event of your own. Here's today's final thought. Symposium, traveling, nuclear anniversaries, it's the busy season at Nuclear Hot Seat. As you know, I will be traveling to New York on February 25th, that's tomorrow, to attend Dr. Helen Caldicott's Symposium on the Dynamics of Possible Nuclear Extinction, taking place this weekend. We are also coming up on what I call Nuclear Anniversary Alley, the confluence of March 11th anniversary of Fukushima, 
March 28th anniversary of Three Mile Island, and April 26th commemoration of Chernobyl. If you add in the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP, site on February 14, we've got the makings of a real nuclear spring. If Dr. Caldecott is right, we're also risking nuclear winter. Be that as it may, it's going to take time to put together a show that does justice to Dr. Caldecott's amazing event, and that's what I intend to do. Take a little bit of time. So the next two nuclear hot seats, March 3rd and 10th, will focus on Fukushima, with presentations from Nuclear Hot Seat's exclusive series, Voices from Japan. Co-produced with Beverly Findlay Kaneko of Families for Safe Energy, Voices from Japan presents interviews and direct statements from scientists, politicians, and activists all around Japan, information they know is important and that is not getting out. These interviews are translated into English by Beverly, and read by our crack team of Japanese professional voiceover artists. That's what will be featured in the shows of March 3 and March 10. Then the following week, March 17, we will carry my report on Dr. Caldecott's symposium. The speakers, the participants, themes and actions, the gossip, even the jokes, as I share with you the spirit of that unprecedented event. In the meantime, Know that I wish that all of you are well, stay safe, and get active. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, February 24, 2015. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, sanluisobispo.com, Friends of the Earth at foe.org, EON3 and filmmakers Mary Beth Brangan and Jim Heddle, counterpunch.org, Reuters, Kyoto, Mainichi.jp, TEPCO itself, AFP, Fukushima Dash Diary, and our friend Iori Mochizuki, the other ABC, Australian Broadcasting Corporation, Wesleyan University, Vice.com, BusinessInsider.com, RT.com slash UK, New York Times.com, the We Drank the Kool Aid bunch over at World Nuclear News, and the Noble clear-sighted nuclear hot seat Facebook community, which you are all invited to join. Theme music was written by me, sung by Marilee Weber. Looks like Weber, sounds like Weber. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on airprogressive.com. Our archive is stashed on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, and it's also available on iTunes, where you can subscribe under podcasts. And our YouTube channel carries each week's show. Lots of opportunities to share the week's news and interviews on all things anti-nuclear. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, We Be Ha Lady and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. So go on, link up to the website, knock yourselves out. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that Sister Megan Rice, Gregory Bortia Obed, and Michael Wally are all still in prison for their nonviolent but highly embarrassing to the U.S. government protests of nuclear weapons. And we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.